The Cold War is often portrayed as a battle of East versus West, of the United States versus the Soviet Union, and the rest of the world choosing a side to support, or having that side chosen for them. But this narrative line ignores the reality that there were a multitude of countries through the Cold War that decided not to choose sides and remain in the middle. One of the most notable of these was a country we have talked about a bit up to this point, but certainly one deserving of more attention. I am of course referring to the land of the southern Slavs, Yugoslavia, led by the charismatic strongman leader Josip Broz Tito. I'm your host David, and today we are going to take a closer look at Yugoslavia in the early Cold War period, a country that went from being a close ally of the Soviet Union to forging its own third way. This is the Cold War. The sponsor of today's video, Mova Globes, offers a truly unique product that would be a great Christmas gift, whether you're getting one for yourself or for your friends or family, fans of history or not. These globes, created by Mova Globes, rotate on their own. All they need is any interior light source, but no cords or batteries are required. It almost sounds too good to be true, but Mova Globes uses first of its kind technology. The globe's rotation is powered by light and the Earth's magnetic field, requiring no cords or batteries. Hidden magnets provide movement when the globe is exposed to ambient lighting, and the fact that there is no cord is a great conversation starter. It's a great gift for someone who has everything or is difficult to find a present for, as globes are available in 40 designs, including world maps, outer space, and even famous artwork. This includes our favorite, kindly sent to us by Mova Globes, that any history fan will find irresistible. The antique terrestrial globe with a vintage map from 1790 created by Giovanni Maria Cassini. Support our channel and get the gift of rotating globes by clicking our unique link in the description. And as a special offer for our viewers, use the code THECOLDWAR and get 10% off. The wartime devastation experienced by Yugoslavia was among the most severe in Europe. The country had been occupied by the Germans, but remained a battleground throughout the war years, and then even beyond as internecine fighting raged. While communist partisans fought the Germans, there was also the Serbian-dominated royalist forces, the Chetniks, who fought against the communists. The Chetniks also, however, alternated between fighting against and collaborating with the German occupiers, depending on the situation at hand. Additionally, there was also the Slovenian Home Guard and the Croatian-dominated Ustazi, who both collaborated with the Nazi occupiers, primarily to further their anti-Serbian agendas. Now, the communists, under the leadership of Tito, were highly successful and by 1944, German forces had been expelled from Serbia and, by April of 1945, from all Yugoslav territory. Most notably in this was that it was done without any significant outside help, especially from the Red Army. This allowed Yugoslavia and Tito to shape their own post-war path without imposition from outside influences. Tito chose to openly side with the socialist bloc in the immediate post-war period, a period which included a number of confrontations with the Western Coalition. These run-ins happened in two main areas. The first one of these was Yugoslav support for the Greek Communists in their civil war, where Tito was openly supplying them with military aid, safe havens, training, and logistical support. While Stalin had agreed with the British and Americans in the so-called Percentages Agreement, that Greece would not fall into the Soviet sphere of influence, Tito was never a part of the agreement. It took direct pressure from the Soviet Union on the Greek communists to break off cooperation between Greece and Yugoslavia, but not before setting Tito and the Moscow mustache on a collision course. Now, the other area where Yugoslavia ran into confrontations with the West was over Istria. Although Istria had been an Italian possession in the years before the Second World War, it was Yugoslavian troops that pushed the German occupiers out of the region, and they felt that Istria should be part of Yugoslavia as a result. The struggle over the city of Trieste resulted in several aircraft shootdowns and condemnations by both the West and from Stalin. The status of Trieste and Istria wasn't fully resolved until the 1975 
Treaty of Osimo, but we should probably cover all of that in a dedicated episode. Let us know in the comments if you're interested in us doing that. So let's move back to the relationship between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. We know that the relationship was strained and would eventually snap entirely, but how did that happen? And most importantly, why did that happen? To understand that, we need to examine the relationship that existed between the two socialist brothers. So as we just mentioned, two situations that strained Yugoslav relations with the West, Istria and Greece. Well, let's keep in mind, both of these situations also strained relations between Belgrade and Moscow. Stalin did not like the independence shown by Tito in challenging the West over Istria, as well as the potential for an expanded conflict which the Soviets could be dragged into. Moscow also didn't support Yugoslav unilateral support for the Greek communists, again fearing being drawn into a wider conflict. But the biggest strain placed on the relationship was not actually over either of these matters, but rather over Bulgaria. At the end of the Second World War, Yugoslavia and the already Sovietized state of Bulgaria had begun talking about an integration project along with the idyllic Adriatic nation of Albania. The ultimate goal of the talks was to establish a unified socialist state. Critically, however, these talks were going on without the official blessing of the Soviet Union. The 1947 Bled Agreement, signed by Tito and Bulgarian leader Georgi Dimitrov, opened the path to the Unified Balkan Federation. Included in this were some territorial transfers, including the return of the Western Outlands to Bulgaria and the unification of Vardar Macedonia with Prin Macedonia. The agreement also created a visa-free region as well as a customs union, and Bulgaria agreed to recognize the Macedonian minority on its territory. Albania, although nominally an independent country, was in reality a Yugoslav satellite and it was expected that it too would join in this new Balkan Union. But clearly, this union didn't happen. So what did happen? Well, the Soviet Union happened. Although Stalin wasn't opposed to the union in principle, he was dismayed that the process was going on without his involvement or blessing. As a result, Bulgarian and Yugoslav officials were summoned to Moscow and criticized for launching the project without prior clearance and guidance from the Soviet Union. While the Bulgarians accepted the chastisement and backed off from the Union, the Yugoslavians were upset by the Soviet involvement. To be honest though, I can understand a Soviet objection to the sudden appearance of a large socialist state with an independent streak a mile wide on its borders. So a few minutes ago I mentioned that Tito was able to pursue a more independent policy because Yugoslavia didn't have Red Army troops on its soil backing up Moscow's will. Additionally, Yugoslavia didn't share a common border with the Soviet Union. This greatly decreased the possibility of direct military action by Moscow against Yugoslavia. Either Hungary or Czechoslovakia shared the same advantage to the detriment of their reform movements in 1956 and 1968 respectively. Now, we know that up until the almost realized United Balkan Federation, Belgrade and Moscow had shared fairly good relations. The Soviet Union had been providing aid to Yugoslavia since the end of the fighting, including food assistance and helping to remove mines that had been laid in the Danube. In return, Tito was a vocal supporter of Stalin and they jointly criticized what was referred to as national communism or communist organizations who advocated for the building of socialism based on the local situation. Additionally, Belgrade was selected as the first headquarters for the common form the centralized organization of all Marxist-Leninist parties meant to promote a unified ideology around the world. But following the formal rebuke from Moscow, relations began to get a little frosty. In early 1948, Stalin declined giving permission for Yugoslav bases to be built in Albania as he didn't like the increasing independent influence Tito held over the Hoziatic state. Despite this lack of permission, however, Tito went ahead with his plans taking advantage of the fact that the Soviet Union shared as many borders with Albania as it did with Yugoslavia. Precisely zero. Moscow quickly responded by refusing to expand the number of technical specialists assigned to Yugoslavia. Tito's response to this was to decline to provide any further economic updates to the Soviet Union. It may seem like a minor thing, but in the world of socialism, economics is everything. 
Stalin's response to this was to recall all Soviet specialists stationed in Yugoslavia. This initiated an exchange of letters between Stalin and Tito. In a letter dated the 27th of March, penned by both Stalin and Molotov, they criticized Yugoslavia for their unfriendly attitude towards the Soviet specialists. They criticized the Yugoslavian Communist Party, doubted the Marxist credentials of some of the Yugoslav leaders, and expressed their disappointment towards the behind-the-scenes criticism that the Yugoslav Communist Party had directed at the Soviet Communist Party for its own lack of revolutionary fervor. A Yugoslav response came on April 13th, firmly stating that the Yugoslavian Communist Party strongly maintained its position as a revolutionary party. They reaffirmed their friendly position towards the USSR, but also complained about Soviet moves to recruit Yugoslavians for use in the secret services. So at this point, the exchange is polite but firm. A minor quarrel, nothing to really worry about. And then, like some sort of late-night drunken text message to an ex, Stalin and Molotov responded. This text, it was actually a letter from May 4th, criticized the tone of the Yugoslavian letter as too ambitious, and accused them of an unwillingness to accept and correct their mistakes. It criticized their negative attitude towards the Soviet specialists, and for failing to clean up the Yugoslavian foreign ministry of what was referred to as English spies. It also went on to call out Belgrade on its benevolent attitude towards the American ambassador in Yugoslavia, as well as his informers, as well as Tito's rejection of ideas put forward to him by the Soviet ambassador, referring to the Soviet Union as the country which saved Yugoslavia from occupation. Finally, the letter accused Yugoslavia of treating its friend and ally, the Soviet Union, the same way that it treated capitalist states such as the United Kingdom and even the United States. Tito's response to all of this was to stand firm, rejecting the accusations, but also calling for a resolution to these misunderstandings to be reached at the June 1948 session of the Common Forum. A proposal was put on the table later in May to hold a special session of the Common Forum whose sole purpose would be to discuss the Yugoslavian Communist Party, however Tito rejected the idea. He also then refused to take part in the already scheduled June Common Forum session, claiming to be ill. Likely, he was simply seeking to avoid facing criticism from not only the Soviet Union, but the other communist parties aligned to Moscow. On June 28th, after being further criticized for its independent-minded policies, its deviations from Marxism, and its unwillingness to constructively face criticism, Yugoslavia was expelled from the Common Forum. This was the official separation of Yugoslavia from the rest of the socialist bloc, a period known as the Inform Bureau. Now, in the lead-up to the split, some Yugoslavian party officials had opposed Tito's pursuit of a more independent path, siding with Moscow and Stalin. After the split, these common informists, as they became known, were purged from the party. Waves of arrests conducted by the UDBA followed and the political prison on the barren island of Goli Otok filled. Tito may not have wanted to follow Stalin's leadership, but was clearly happy to borrow from some of his methods. Moscow, for its part, responded to the split by beginning a troop buildup on the Hungarian-Yugoslav border, as well as encouraging the Hungarian army to strengthen itself. However, the demonstration of Western commitment to stopping communism in Korea caused the potential invasion of Yugoslavia to be abandoned. And, well, how did the West react to the split in the bloc? Well, they took advantage of it, of course, and began cultivating a deeper relationship with Yugoslavia. Economic aid was provided, and by the early 1950s, the United States had even begun supplying military aid. Because, naturally. The West was courting Yugoslavia, hoping to draw them into the Western military alliance, NATO. Tito, however, was wary of trading one master for another, and made the decision not to join the alliance, instead deciding to align Yugoslavia to a third way, what would eventually become the Non-Align Movement, officially formed in 1961, but we're going to cover that more in a future episode. Incidentally, it was at this point that a domestic Yugoslavian arms industry was created. Domestically, the split caused some shifts as well, as I'm sure you'd expect. 
the country continued to be a one-party state under the control of the Popular Front, a coalition dominated by the Communists, but steps began to be taken to move away from the Stalinist policies that had dominated the immediate post-war period. This of course does not mean that Tito intended to move towards democracy, simply to make changes to allow for greater efficiency. Most notably in this was the process of decentralization he undertook to allow for better local decision making. In 1952, the Yugoslavian Communist Party was renamed the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, a federation of the communist parties from each of the regions that made up the country. So that would be a League of Communists of Croatia, of Serbia, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, of Macedonia, of Montenegro, of Slovenia, of Kosovo, and of Vojvodina. Now, 1952 also saw the implementation of the Basic Law, which underlined the importance of personal rights and freedom of association for working people. This was a necessary element for another reform that was introduced as part of the economic reforms in Yugoslavia, a unique mechanism in the socialist world at the time, worker self-management. Workers' councils were put in charge of the direction of enterprises and they received a share of the profits of production. Based on the concept of creating and maintaining the interest of workers in increasing production to their own benefit, this obviously differed greatly from the Marxist orthodoxy of the Soviet economy and has earned the name market socialism. The combination of market socialism, decentralized government, and Yugoslavia's key role in the non-aligned movement has come together to be known as Titoism, policies that continued in the country until it tragically broke apart in the Balkan Wars of the early 1990s. Titoist ideas influenced Alexander Dubček's attempts at reform in Czechoslovakia during the ill-fated Prague Spring, and even influenced policies in places such as Muammar Gaddafi's Libya. We will cover more on Titoism and Yugoslavia, including its successes and failures, in later episodes to help further explain and clarify Yugoslavia's unique position in the Cold War. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, but to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have made the bell button a fraternal bell button for life. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support through www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership would be greatly appreciated and helps to keep the channel going. If you aren't able to provide financial support at this time, please share this video and all of our videos widely and freely. This is the Cold War channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.